Hey there, welcome back to our Sky Tonight program. My name is Seth Mayo. I'm the curator of astronomy for the Loma Planetarium at MOAS. And in this edition of the program, we're covering the dates of December 13th through December 19th. We're going to start things off by talking about the peak of the annual Geminid meteor shower that happens at the beginning of this week. Then we'll talk about Comet Leonard again as it transitions into our evening sky and the possibilities of finding it then. We'll follow it up with a discussion of the last full moon of 2021. So let's get to it. Right at the beginning of the week, on the evening of Monday, December 13th, or probably best, the morning of Tuesday, December 14th, is the peak of the annual Geminid meteor shower. And the Geminids usually run from November 19th through December 24th. And of course, it's named after that famous winter constellation of the Gemini twins, which we can see if you stay up a little bit later in the evening looking towards the east. For reference, it's near the really famous constellation of Orion the Hunter, which we find here. Here's Orion's shoulders, there's his belt right here. And to the left of Orion, or really to the north of those stars, are the stars of Gemini, which are not as bright, but there are two stars in particular that do stand out, and that's the heads of Gemini. This star here is the brother named Pollux, and right above it is his brother named Castor. To turn on the outline, will give you just a reference point to where the stars are of Gemini and the picture, and the radiant point for the Geminids is situated right above Castor in this area of the sky. And in Stellarium, we can highlight that just to show you the approximate location of the radiant point. Now keep in mind, with radiant points, you don't have to exactly know where that is, but it's good to know that if you trace the meteors back at this time of year, many of them will radiate from this point in the sky, hence the name Geminids. And this really is one of the best meteor showers that we can see all year long. It's one of the most active, it has some very bright meteors, and it's very unique because it's one of the few meteor showers that comes from an asteroid instead of a comet. As we've mentioned with previous meteor showers, many of those are from the debris trail of comets, these icy rocky objects that are going around the sun, leaving behind a trail of debris, dust and ices and rocky material. And at the same time each year, Earth slams into that material. But for the Geminids, each November and December, Earth is actually moving through the debris trail of what's called 3200 Phaethon. And this really is an interesting object, sometimes known as a rock comet or an active asteroid, because as it goes around the sun, the sun heats up the rocky material, possibly fracturing it, allowing it to release dust and fine grains that leave the asteroid and sometimes are swept away by the sun's stellar wind. So since 3200 Phaethon has some activity, it has some characteristics that make it seem like a comet, because comets get active when they get close to the sun. And 3200 Phaethon is also known as an Apollo asteroid. That is a class of near-Earth objects that cross the orbit of Earth. In the case of 3200 Phaethon, it actually gets pretty close to the sun within about 0.14 AU. That is 14% the distance between the Earth and the sun, which is about a third the distance that even Mercury orbits from the sun. So it does get close enough to the sun for it to have interesting interactions when it does, leaving behind material in its wake. Interestingly, 3200 Phaethon is in the same family of asteroids as that famous Chelyabinsk meteor that exploded over Russia back in 2013. If you remember, that was a 60-foot-wide meteor that exploded over the city of Chelyabinsk, causing the glass on buildings to break and explode, injuring many, many people. It was quite a dramatic celestial event in that part of the world. That meteor is also an Apollo asteroid. So it shows you how these types of objects can interact with the Earth in various ways. Now, if you want to observe and appreciate the Geminid meteor shower, you can start a little bit later in the evening. I have the time set to 9 p.m. local time. By then, the constellation and the radiant point will be high enough above the eastern horizon for you to see. But just keep in mind, in the evening, you do have to contend with a rather large moon in the sky. The moon will be at a waxing gibbous phase, about 77% lit on this evening. And of course, that rather large moon does provide some light pollution. That reflected light from the sun can obscure some of those faint meteors shooting across the sky. 
But if you are observing this in the early evening, you still have a chance to see what are called bolides or fireballs. These are very large meteors that really shine as they go across the sky. And you can also find what are called earth grazers. Those are meteors that graze our sky and you can see them for longer and through a larger swath of the star field. And those mostly happen in the evening before midnight. But if you do stay up later and later, your chances of seeing more meteors increases. So let's do that now. We're gonna speed up time here. As we do, as we move into the late hours of the 13th and really the early morning of the 14th, you'll find Gemini and the Geminids radiant point get higher and higher in the sky. Once we get to about two in the morning, I know that's pretty early or pretty late, depending on who you are. But once we get to that time, local time, a little bit after two, we have set now, but close enough, you'll find that the constellation and the radiant point are straight up in the sky. And that provides an increased chance of seeing even more of the Geminids by then. But even by two and a little bit after, the moon is still out. So you may need to get out by about three in the morning. And by then, the moon will have set in the western horizon and that will provide a bit darker sky and possibly creating conditions for the highest rate of Geminids to be seen. So from about 3 a.m. to the pre-dawn hours before the sun rises may be your best bet. And this is the morning of Tuesday the 14th. As we continue on here, we can still see Gemini high in the sky, but don't wake up too near sunrise because that sun will start to obscure what you can see in the sky. As we get to closer to about 6 a.m., you're gonna have a little bit of the dawn start to creep in the east here, and that will quickly diminish your chances of seeing these meteor streak overhead. So you do have a prime window between maybe three and maybe possibly 5.45, six in the morning to really see as many Geminids as possible. But of course, it depends on your local sky conditions, your weather, the light pollution in your area generally. But as we've said before, you could see this early in the evening, even with the moon out, because there is a chance to see these larger meteors streak across, especially those earth grazers. So no matter what time you get out on those two days or even days around this, because this meteor shower lasts for longer, there are other times you may catch the Geminids as well. So whenever you get a chance to get out there, hopefully you can see a Geminid meteor or two for the Geminids this year, but who knows? You always just have to wait and see what happens. But it's great to realize these streaks of light are coming from an ancient asteroid that circles the sun, releasing material that allows us to appreciate another celestial spectacle in the skies above. If you tune into last week's episode, I had an opportunity to mention a comet that is possibly visible in our sky, this time called Comet Leonard, another one of these icy rocky objects that is nearing the sun. It hasn't been in our sky in about 80,000 years, and it's probably the last time it will be in the inner solar system because after this close approach, it's going to be flung out into interstellar space. And last week, the comet was in the early morning below the star Arcturus, if you were looking in the east before sunrise. But it's been moving so very quickly that it doesn't stay in the same place for very long. And now by this week, it is transitioning into our evening sky, if you look to the west and really the southwest. So to help us out here, in Stellarium, we can actually select this comet, Comet Leonard, or what's called C slash 2021A1 is the more technical name for this comet that was discovered actually early this year. And we're going to progress the dates forward. And when we do, you're gonna see the comet rise higher and higher. On the evening of the 13th, it's too close to the sun to easily see. So let's move ahead here to Tuesday the 14th. It's a little bit higher up there. You'll see it right there, at least it highlighted. And then we'll continue on as we get to the 15th, then the 16th, and then by the 17th and 18th, that's actually when this comet will reach its closest position to Venus. It's actually doing so in the solar system. So that'll be kind of neat to see, possibly Comet Leonard and the brightest planet we can see in the sky, Venus right there. They are gonna be very different in brightness. Now keep in mind with this comet, we don't know how bright it will be by this point. All the predictions were saying that last week and even this week that you could possibly see it with your naked eyes, but there's no guarantee. Comets are notoriously unpredictable. We just don't know how it will behave as it gets closer and closer to the sun. But it's still exciting to maybe look out for this. If you have binoculars or a telescope, you may catch a glimpse of this fuzzy little object in the sky. But who knows, it could get even brighter and more easily visible in this area. 
So this is on the 17th and 18th when it's pretty close to Venus, and this point on the 18th is just to the left and below the planet, and then we'll move on to the 19th here by the end of the week here, and it's still in this vicinity in this part of the sky. So that's fun that if you couldn't get out in the early morning to see it, you possibly can get out in the evening. We don't know how bright it will be, and also keep in mind it's moving very, very quickly. So evening to evening, it drastically changes position, but hopefully with a combination of this video and Stellarium and possibly a website called theskylive.com, you can keep track of this and maybe see this ancient icy object grace our skies. By the evening of Saturday, December 18th, we officially have a full moon when the moon is opposite of the sun in the sky, and when you see most of the disk, the side facing the Earth. And of course, this is when the moon is large and it's bright, and you'll see it right after sunset rising in the east as we see here. So we can move ahead in time and watch that moon rise. Great time of year in the holidays to kind of observe and appreciate the moon. The exact time of this full moon, at least Eastern Standard Time, is 1137. So for us here, it technically happens on the 18th. We can also call this full moon occurring on the 19th, especially if you go by universal time. And the full moon at this time of the year is usually called the cold moon. And for very good reason, at least here in the Northern Hemisphere, this is the colder time of the year. Winter is just about to begin. And with all these cool temperatures and winter weather upon us and a full moon combined, we have the full cold moon. So if you're out observing the moon, depending on your location, you may be bundling up, possibly enjoying some hot beverage as you appreciate the evening sky, the end of the year, the holidays, and what the universe has to offer us. Hey, that's it for another edition of our Sky Tonight program. We really thank you for tuning in and all the support you've given us and the really nice comments and questions that we're getting as well. We really appreciate you all and the community that we have built around this and a shared appreciation for nature and astronomy and the universe. We can all explore the universe together and do it in a way that enriches our lives in so many ways. So thank you very much. And with that, we hope to see you around here in Daytona Beach at the Museum of Arts and Sciences and of course, our Loman Planetarium. We are still running shows daily. We have a lot of great programs, so please check out our schedule online for any more information about what's going on. And with that, we hope to see you back here again. And as always, happy stargazing.